and then calculate these things. Oil prices are up, the manufacturers down, or whatever. You know, I mean, you can get something out of that. I'm not a business person. Okay. Okay. Because I'm just wondering. Well, go ask a business person. <laughs> I'm not a business person. I still like the example, though. Okay? To teach you basically the concept of variance and variability. It just brings questions. Yeah, it brings more questions than answers. Okay. Well, that's, maybe that's a good thing. Subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> Write down numbers for a year, do the correlation. <laughs> So, good work on this homework. It was a long one. And, uh, <coughs> this is lecture number something or other. Let's see, we're on note 14, so this must be lecture 16. Okay. Yes. My name. All right. So, our, let's see, we have another homework in chapter 4 that's due. Next Tuesday. Are there any questions about it? Yes. Okay, go. How do you do number 100? How do you do number 100? We haven't really talked too much about approximation, approximate methods yet, so why don't we talk about approximate methods before? Well, how do you calculate the exact? You calculate the exact mean of variance uh, by, by just doing the, the integrals. Well, I thought it was I don't know if it's right or wrong. Okay, you want to know the answers? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, for number 100, exact mean and variance. Oh, uh, really? There's no answer? Well, RF just gives you an open project on one homework, and then you expect you to do it next week, and it's like, it's open answer, not really exact. Okay. So there's only one where there's no short answer until 102, and I forgot what happened at 102. You're just supposed to get, um, all right, you want to get the answers to those, too. Okay, probably. Um, okay, here's what I got for 100. 4.100 part A. The, uh, well, the exact, exact <coughs> mean and variance, mean and variance of y equals 1 over x, are u, are ey, exact is um, log 2 over 10.
find something approximate e y. I didn't write decimals. It's 115 plus 4 over 5 times 27 times 12. Okay? If you want the exact fraction. Okay? And I didn't even write it in prime powers. I guess I could have. 27 times 12 is, is 3 and a fourth times 4. But, oh, I actually canceled another factor of 4. So this is what? Um, so I didn't crunch all my numbers completely. This is 1 over 5 times 3 and a fourth. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the approximate areas is even worse looking. Actually, it's not too bad. Approximate variance doesn't come out too bad. Approximate variance, I got to be uh, 1 over 3 to the 5th times 5 squared. Is that anywhere close? That's 80 times 25. No, it's not. Let's play more. Let's see, how, how small is that? Calculate that for me in your calculator. 1 over 3 to the 5th times 5 squared. You guys make them cross. I'm hoping this is not anywhere. get those numbers. Okay? That's a lot of information. Okay. 4.102 uh, answers are um, the expected value of capital theta. Here's that crazy with capital theta again. Okay? Is about um, arctan y naught over x naught. Okay? And there's no adjustment, it turns out, okay, plus zero, all right? In other words, there's a formula for the mean. The mean of a, the mean, the approximate mean of a random variable of a function of two other variables would be just the, um, the function of the ratio <coughs> of, the of the means, okay? Plus a term, plus another term, we're going to get into, and that's about zero in this case. And the variance of theta, is approximately sigma squared over x naught squared plus y naught squared. Okay. Those numbers. Okay. Um, for, so does that mean we have to um, figure out what um, rho is equal to, or does rho cancel out somewhere so we don't need to? Rho is zero in this case. Rho is zero. Because they're independent. Okay. X and y are independent. squared. What's the sigma squared? That's the common variance. What you have is you have, what the problem is, many people may not have even looked at it. What you have is you have two sides of a right triangle or any kind of random variables. Okay? This is x and this is y. Okay? The lengths are independent random variables with mean little x naught and mean little y naught. Okay, we'll assume that they're not negative random variables too, so that it makes sense. Okay? And, is this okay. the derivative of arctan 1 over x squared plus y squared? Yeah, so d by dx, arctan x is 1 over x squared plus 1, uh, 1 plus x squared. Okay. okay, and I can tell you the rest of the business. Okay, I gave you enough answers. Okay, but this is what you'll need to know that. Your calculus book. Okay? One real question. Yes. For number 89, can we use those memory generating function properties and all that to prove it? Yeah. Okay. That's what you need to use. Okay. Yeah. That'll be easier. 
I thought you had to do it by everything by hand. Can we uh, look at the back of the book um, and take the moment generating function for our normal and dependent variable and just use that formula for the? Oh, yeah, I mean, you don't have to derive the moment generating function from a standard normal. It's right there. It's given. Yeah. Yeah. Moment generating function from a standard normal. It fits in the back of the book. I gave it to the other list, too. Oh, we did? Yeah. It says moment, if I've got the moment generating function n01, T is equal to T squared over 2. And I also had the moment gen I didn't do this one yet, moment generating function of N mu sigma squared of T is e to the mu T plus 1 half sigma squared T squared. Why don't we get the second result from the first? This implies this. This I didn't actually do the calculation, but it said do it at home. Remember at the end of the hour last time? Um, what I want to do is show this implication, and then I can go back and show the moment generating function of the standard normal if you want. Actually, I did pretty much show it. I, I wrote out the uh, exponent completed the square. Question. It's in the book. For, no, for this, do I have to prove this, or can we just use it for number 89? You can use it. You can use either of these facts, both of these facts. Okay? okay. Use both of these facts. Okay. This is uh, in the book, I believe. So as I pointed out, if there's an example in the book, you may use it. Example B. Yeah. Can we use the back of the book again? Or they do that? The generation sentences or everything. Yeah, it's not going to help you, though, on that problem. Yes, you can use the back of the book. So anything because the back of the book. Yeah, the back of the book. Everything that's in the back of the book was done in the, in the examples here. He has, he has covered this material well. So, how do you show that in fact, he, he was using one of the properties to show this, but how would you do this? Um, well, because mu of zero, of, you can just go from there. And then. Okay. Let's see, how would I represent something with, um, if I had, if let, let Z be N01, okay, a standard normal variable. Okay? How would I get how would I get an, a standard a normal variable with mean mu and variance sigma squared from Z? What can I do? Generate a N mu sigma squared random variable from Z. How would I do that? Suppose I didn't want means mean zero and variance one, I wanted to mean five and variance 100, okay? Yeah, and you mean by shifting the graph? Yeah, okay. So x equals um, u plus x. x is my new random variable generated an n0 uh, sigma squared random variable x. From Z. Okay? How would I do that? In other words, make X some function of Z. How would you do it? X equals mu plus. How would I get it? Now I need N0 sigma squared. How do I get N0 sigma squared from N01? Well, it turns out that I just multiply by sigma. Uh, maybe we can go over this. Uh, this is something that you had in your previous course. Okay? If Z is normal, then. Uh, this linear function of z is also normal. Do you remember that from your first course? <laughs> okay. Let's just check that. What's the density? Density of x. This is a linear function. Okay. At least you know, understand that this has mean, mu, and variance sigma squared, right? That much we do know from this course. Okay. Because if I calculate the mean of x. So the mean of x is equal to mu plus sigma times the mean of z by linearity of the expectation, which is mu plus sigma times zero equals mu. All right? No. Okay, let's backtrack and see this. So that so x has mean mu. All right? We're going to 
Tone <laughs> that down your throat. Okay. All right, it says mean view. So I'm being a little bit what? bullying here. Let's see. So I've taken z to be standard normal, mean zero variance one, and normally distributed. I define x to be oh. mu plus sigma z. I now calculate the mean of x is mu plus sigma. E of C equals mu plus zero equals mu. What about the variance of x? How do you calculate the variance of mu plus sigma c? Let's go back to basics a little bit. How do you calculate the variance of mu plus sigma c? Just using properties of variance, right? We've been working on that a lot over the last week. The mu you can get rid of because it's added a constant. And then you bring out the sigma to a square, right? The variance of z is assumed to be 1, so this is sigma squared times 1 equals sigma squared. All right, so we've done this computation. Now this little computation. So we verified, indeed, that x does have mean, mu, and variance sigma squared. Is it normally distributed? Is x normal? Let's calculate the density of x. <laughs> All right? The density of x, according to our change in density rule, is Gives the density of z, where z equals z of x, the inverse relation, times dx dz. The rule is, excuse me, dz dx. The rule is f of x dx, if I put the dx over there, equals f of z dz. Right? Probability equals probability. So I write this. Now, what is z in terms of x? So this is the density of z. At z of x, what's z in terms of x? I have to invert this relationship. z equals x minus mu over sigma. And now I take that inverted relationship also and I differentiate it, and I get 1 over sigma. Okay? That's the rule for transforming a density. What is the density of a standard normal? It's e to the minus z squared over 2, and then divide by the whole thing by square root of 2 pi. So this would be 1 over square root of 2 pi, e to the minus x minus mu over sigma squared over 2, times 1 over sigma, which is indeed the, standard, the normal density. I still get a normal density, but now the one with mean mu and variance sigma squared. So indeed, x is normal, right? So the normal family is just set up so that uh, if you take a linear function of anybody in a normal family, you still get somebody in the normal family. You need this sigma to draw the square root of 5. This is the density, okay? Minus infinity, less than x, less than infinity. Okay. So that was the standard. That was the normal density, not the standard normal density. This is the density with, with parameter mu and sigma squared. We also know uh, now, in fact, that indeed by this method, that those parameters do in fact represent the mean and variance of the random variable. Okay, because we just verified that indeed. <laughs> mean variance of x are mu and sigma squared. So this would have been another approach to showing what the parameters are. We would have done originally. Except if we had to take the variance and all that stuff and these properties of variance so much, so we didn't do it that way. Okay, what about moment generating function? Now the moment generating function therefore of a mu sigma squared is the moment generating function of x. Moment generating function of x Therefore, expectation e to the tx. This is a nice way to write it down. Okay? So instead of doing integral, I'm going to do expectation e to the t mu plus sigma z like this. Okay? Now I can just multiply that out, bring out constant term, constant factors. Anything that's not a random variable and multiplying that. I Bring out, right? So this is uh, e to the t mu, expectation e to the t sigma z. Okay. Uh, 
Now we're going to assume we know the moment generating function of capital Z. And that is this e to the t squared over 2. Now that's something we had to do. We had to do one moment generating function. We had to do one integral. Let's see. Um, that was integral e to the tz e to the minus z squared over 2 over the square root of 2 pi. Now recall how I did that last time. What I did is I completed the exponent. So we completed the square in the exponent, right? So it's e to the minus, and it's completing the square in z. Minus 1 half z squared. To get the plus tz, I'm going to put a minus 2z after the parentheses. Okay? <coughs> minus 2tz. That's minus 1 half of the tz. Okay? That's, and then that's just what I have, that dz, right? And then my square root of 2 pi. I'll do this moment generating function for you, okay, that I kind of referred to last time. How do you, how do you put the square now in z? T squared. Yeah, you add a t squared under the parentheses, you add a t squared. Now t is just a constant, the integration variable is z. So that means I have changed now the exponent by e to the minus one half t squared. I have to compensate for that, and I can't just change it. Right? So this has been added in. Okay? This this bubble has been added in, so I have to take the bubble out. Even minus one half t squared. I should have plus one half, because I put a minus one half in that. Oh. I put a plus t squared, but it's multiplied by a minus one half. That's a minus one half t squared. So I have to compensate by <coughs> plus one half t squared by the property of the exponential. That's just a factor. And I'm done. Because I claim this integral is what? That integral is 1 because it is the integral of a normal density, e to the minus 1 half z minus t squared, with the square root of 2 pi, where the, the various parameters, 1 and the mean parameter is t. Right? That's a normal density. It just takes this form where mu is t and sigma. That, that's the number one. Okay? And I'm done. So we know that the moment generating function of the standard normal is e to the t squared over 2. Okay? So now I can plug that in here. What's this then? This integral. This is an expectation, it's an integral. And I can regard that actually as the moment generating function of the standard normal at t sigma. That's the nice little trick, all right? Just replace t by t sigma. And so this is e to the t mu times the moment generating function of z at t sigma. And then I just plug the formula in. That's t replaced by t sigma. I get e to the t mu times e to the 1 half t sigma, the quantity squared. OK? So I get something that depends on the parameters. I get mu t plus 1 half sigma squared t sigma. So that's the moment generating function. Is that circle equal to 1? Yeah. How do you say? Because it's an integral of a normal density. Oh. Of density of n t 1. Okay? Yeah, t is the mean. Okay. And sigma is 1. Oh. Okay. So that's a normal density. Let's see. Cute, huh? Okay. All right. So then, then following that, I what I'm saying is that I can go ahead and calculate this integral now by saying I didn't write it down. Okay. It is. So so in, so in general, what I get is I get. This I get a, I get an exponential with a quadratic exponent, no constant term. Okay, because you got to have uh, m of zero is one. Okay, e to the zero. So there can't be a constant term. It's a quadratic exponent. So that's general. So then and uh, and then you always have.
have to have a non-negative on the t-squared too. Positive t-squared too. Okay. So that's what the moment generating function of a normal looks like. And that's all you have to do. You have to come up with something of that form to solve your problem, number 89. Okay. And then you would just read off the mean and the variance parameters. Okay. From this, you just read off the, the coefficient of the t is the mean, coefficient of the t squared is one half sigma squared. So they're in terms of sum and stuff, right? Yeah. What you're going to show is the sum of independent normals is again normal. Oh. What you're going to show is that the linear combination of independent normals is again normal. Again, and the independence is, is key there, so that you can use one of the properties of moment generating functions is written in the book. Okay? Okay. So that is not a tough problem. It's a fun problem. Okay? <laughs> it's fun. Wow, I, this is a little calculation. Oh, I get this nice result. Okay? Yeah. Get this nice result. At least this class you get an answer. <laughs> so moment generating functions are generally kind of fun when it works out. If it doesn't work out, it's, it's a misery. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, so maybe we should go on. We should, let's do this approximate method stuff where I was giving you the answers. How do you find? The reason we're doing this is is for setting up a later section where we're going to apply these formulas that we derive in section 4.6. Um, so it's kind of cookbook, but at least it it. It uh, reinforces your understanding, or you, know, you work with covariances and so on. And you get a little reminder of what Taylor's expansion is with covariables, okay, which maybe you haven't really seen in Calc 3 or even. Okay? Okay. How do we expand a function to variables in a Taylor series? Can't remember that. Okay. Okay. Okay, so approximate um, approximation, let's see, what are we going to call this section? Um, this is note 13. Uh, can't go ahead and you can go. Um, okay, note 13. Oh, I had one more thing on that, note 13. It was a nasty thing. Uh, a random sum of a sequence of random variables, independent random variables. Um, we should probably look at that. Let's look at number 93 before we go on. Number 93 in the text. I'm, I'm going to skip this example in the notes. But I'm going to do problem number, number 93 instead because it's more intuitive than this example. Okay. Find the distribution of a geometric sum of exponential random variables by using moment generating functions. What do they mean by that? Sounds nice, doesn't it? Let's do one more example before we finish. This will tie together uh, conditional expectation and the moment generating function. Okay? So number 93. I think it's a good problem. And it's one of those good, you know, it's a wonderful problem. Okay. So... <laughs> Sounds like powers of powers. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so okay, so let let n be geometric p, and let x one, x two, x three be an infinite sequence. No, what? Oh, independent. Uh, exponential random variables with each with parameter lambda. Here's one of the ones that works out. Okay. Independent of of n and independent of n.
Okay? So you're flipping a coin. You're flipping a coin, and n is it has probably heads p, and you're waiting until you come up with heads. Right? But that each time you toss, you actually add in one of these. Okay, so what you're going to consider is s equals the sum xi. I goes from one to capital n, right? Where n is a random variable. Okay, so that's a random sum of random variables. you're going to be doing, and then off on the side in some other time zone, you're going to be flipping another coin, which is a very small probability of heads, but you're going to be flipping it many, many times, okay, per second, so that, and then you're waiting until heads appears on that coin, that's an exponential random variable, okay, where the lambda is set up so that it matches the parameter of the, of the coin and so on, and the number of times you toss it per unit time. But remember, I said NP equals lambda, okay, was our definition. So really what you have is that uh, an exponential variable you think of as a geometric random variable, a continuous time. You wait until first heads, okay? Wait, is n um, the number yeah. of times we toss the coin before we get heads or something like that? Yeah. Okay. Number of tosses so, until heads, including the toss that you get on heads. So, okay. so that's what n is? That's what capital N is. And that's on one coin. And then you have some other coin that you're flipping in continuous time. Okay, and those, and those are, are geometric, geometric, those are roughly geometric random variables for that, okay? So you're adding those, okay? So the S is the, another random variable. And S is the sum of these uh, continuously generated random variables. So the geometric. Yes. So the That's much. Okay, so then, so, then, so then I'm going to take the number of those that I'm going to generate I'm going to generate a bunch of those, and I'm going to just take as many as the, I tell, the other coin tells me to take. I and mean, these are independent. Okay? So you're flipping along, and you wait until you get heads, and then you're flipping along, and you wait until you get heads, and continuous time, you're flipping along, and you get heads. And then how many times am I going to wait? It depends on the other coin. Okay? How many times am I going to get a 1? Alright? So, so basically, I'm going to get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And on the other coin, I'm getting either 0, and 0, and 0, and then here, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then, oh, I got a 1 there, too. Okay, now I stop. Oh. This, this length of this whole business now, okay. So we flip a continuous coin until we get a 1, and then we flip another coin. Yeah. Yeah. A separate coin. Yeah, a separate coin, and then I can do a piece until I get a 1, and then I, separate, then I flip another coin. And now I continue to go until I get a 1 on both of them. And what do we need the sum? That's just the total length of time then. This is the total length of time here. This is, this is x1 is uh -huh. a continuous time. This is x2 is a continuous time. This is x3 is a continuous time. And this is x4 is a continuous time. And uh. n is equal to 4. OK? <laughs> oh, OK. S is the sum of those. S is the length. Okay, so what's the distribution of s? Any guesses? No. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> why would we need to do this? Why not? Go to the math class. <laughs> <laughs> well, that doesn't make sense. What do you mean it doesn't make sense? You can tell the engineers from the math. <laughs> 
You're basically doing random censoring of, of the finish time, basically. Oh, you're not done yet. Okay. Oh, you're not done yet. Oh, you're not done. Oh, you're done. Okay. So in other words, what you're doing is you're, you're adding lifetime. Okay, if this is the death time, so, oh, you're not dead yet, we fixed you. Oh, you're not dead yet, we fixed you. Oh, you're not dead yet, we fixed you. Oh, you're dead. Okay. So now... So S is the geometric and the XIs are the exponential. So is it, yeah. will it be the sum? So it'll be... It's a random like, sum of these exponentials. Yeah. Sum, yeah. So it'll be like, like one minus, I don't know, the probability of the exponential to the N minus one times... Okay, so let's just go ahead and calculate the mode generating function. You can then at the end we can say, oh, that was obvious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's okay. Great. So what is the moment generating function of okay, first we have to recall some facts. What's the moment generating function of a geometric random variable? It's, e to the it's out of the back. Yeah, e to the tp over one. Minus one minus p e to the tp. Yeah. Actually you had to derive that, right? Yes. You're going to derive that, but the answer is in the back. Okay. I didn't even know that. Okay. Oh, it's in the back. This is the homework problem was to do this problem. Okay. I did that. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I want to calculate. So this is uh, problem number 85, right? Okay. So now what's the moment generating function of S? That's going to be uh, expectation e to the summation i goes from 1 to capital N of xi. Alright, so I'm just putting in a definition. All the time to t. Okay? <clears throat> Plug in the definition of s into the form. It's e to the expectation e to the ts. All right, now I need to use condition. Well, I want to use condition. I want a condition on the value of random variable capital N. So for example, when N equals to four, what's this expectation and so on. So this is going to be an expectation of a conditional expectation. I goes from one to little uh, e to the two times this. Okay, and this bunch of parentheses and E signs. Okay. <laughs> okay. An extra E sign and parentheses and a, and a vertical bar and a capital N. So what I do is I need to calculate this inner expectation, which means I get to freeze the geometric random variable. All right. So then I just have an ordinary sum of exponentials. And so then this becomes the inner expectation is uh, let's see, what is it? It's, um, so we can think of capital N now as a fixed integer, right? Like four or five or what have you, okay? And so how do you calculate that? Well, that's a product of moment generating functions by independence of the exponentials. So that's expectation e to the uh, t x1 x2. I guess here I'm rederiving one of the results of the book. Given that. Okay. And that's going to be a product of moment well, generating functions. Your capital N is frozen and the xi's are independent. And, the, and you have a product of independent random variables here, right? Either the tx1 is a random variable. It's independent of e to the tx2, they're mutually independent, right? These capital N random variables. So that means the expectation of product is a product of expectations. So that means I'm just getting the uh, moment generating function of an exponential n times. So this is expectation of the moment generating function of x1 at t to the power n. Okay, so that's what the conditional expectation is on the inside is an nth power of the moment generating function. So that's what you said, powers of the powers or something. So, Why what equals that? The inside? Yeah, the inside is just this. 
Because <laughs> it's just the nth power, because this is the expectation e to the tx1 down to expectation e to the txn. So are we okay. assuming all the xn are the same, or what's so special so about x1 that we... I'm just going. I'm just using that as the, as the expectation of an exponential from the lambda. Uh -huh. Just a notation. I'll put it this way. You'd rather, okay? Okay. Oh, so, all of them have parameter lambda. Yeah, all have okay, parameter so lambda. Each equal. with parameter lambda. Yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. This problem is going to be nasty if they don't have <laughs> parameter lambda. So it's an nth power, not a product. The product is the nth power because they each have the same parameter. If we have different parameters, all things are off. That's the problem. Okay? How did you give This is a product, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Each of these expectations is lambda over lambda minus t. So this is lambda over lambda minus t. This is just lambda over lambda minus t to the nth. That's the that's the inner expectation, the conditional expectation. But so now, what are you in? What? Oh, okay, you're getting rid of that. Okay. Capital N, N is the random variable. I froze it. Okay. Now I'm unfreezing it, and it's, oh. just, it's random variable. So now I have another. The, my last expectation is now um, that uh, I, I'm, I have some fixed number raised to the capital N power. Capital M is the random variable. How do I calculate that expectation? Now here's the trick. The trick is to write this power as e to something. Yeah. What would a to the n equals e to the a log uh, e to the n log a, like that? Okay. All right. This is n goes inside here. The a the log cancel. A to the n e to the n log a. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. That's how you can always write a power in terms of exponentials. Just change the base, then fix it up with a log. Okay? E to the log a is a. Alright? E to the log a is a. Right? So it's a to the n. Okay? Okay. Okay. So do we just write that as expectation e to the n log a? Yeah, so this is expectation. E to the capital N log lambda over lambda minus T. Okay? So it's, it's can be written as. In other words, this is something like a moment generating function, only it's not, only the parameter is all weird. Okay? The parameter is log lambda over lambda minus T instead of T. Okay? So let's just call that S. Alright, right? So this is just, if I call this S. And this is the moment generating function of n and s. Okay? So now I just have to plug s into that formula over there. And it turns out that it comes out pretty nice. If I put s equals log lambda over lambda minus t into in place of t here, right? What do I get? Well, since you have an exponential and the parameter is a log. Those cancel, and you simply get that this is, well, this is a good path. Okay, this is lambda over lambda minus t times p over 1 minus 1 minus p times lambda over lambda minus t. Okay. In other words, this is, this is e to the s here, right? This is e to the s. I just write this as e to the s. I just rewrote this as e to the s, and then it falls out. Okay, so lambda over lambda minus t is like the role of e to the s. Now I could rewrite this as s instead of t over here, but anyway, I'm playing a little bit with changing variable names. Okay, and then for, write this out. What does this come out to? This is a very simple business, and this simply comes out to um, multiply top and bottom by lambda minus t. Okay? You're going to get rid of this, you're going to get rid of this, you're going to put a lambda minus t here. Okay? Place 1. Okay? And I should write that 
it down so you saw what I did. <laughs> okay. Okay. Equals this. All right. And so then when you all it does clears, what do you get? You get a lambda p over um, the lambdas cancel. Lambda here, and lambda cancel. You get lambda p minus t. Lambdas cancel. In the bottom here. This lambda, the one here, and this lambda they cancel. How does it Minus, this lambda minus t is gone now. Oh, okay, you multiply it down. Okay, does that make sense now? So that means that the geometric sum of these exponentials, each with parameter of any kind of exponential t, with parameter lambda, is exponential with parameter lambda p. So that means I've shrunk the death rate, okay? It's not dying as fast. And it has a chance for revival. Right, chance for revival. Well, that's not the sum, is it? That's the moment generating function. For the? For the sum. For S, the capital sum. S. Yeah. I thought that's M N of S. No, I started here. E, M sub S of T. Ran it all the way down to there. M sub S of T is lambda P over lambda P minus T. Well, this is T S. Mm -hmm. Equals expectation, conditional expectation, equals this, equals this, equals this, equals this, equals, this, equals, this, equals that. Okay? <laughs> it's a bit of a long calculation. Okay. But that's the method. Wow. I'm totally lost. Okay. I started with expectation e to the ts, capital S. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I should do this. And I ended up with that over there. So that means s. The moment generating function of capital S has been identified as lambda p over lambda p minus t. That's the moment generating function of an exponential random variable with parameter lambda p. Remember that? Okay. So we do have an exponential variable. The S is an exponentially distributed. Why does that make sense? Okay. Well, this kind of reminds me of that Poisson problem we had earlier where we had to prove um, the Poisson of yeah. two something was actually lambda a or... or yeah, yeah. There, there was, yeah. A, there was a, a sensory there, a marked Poisson thing. You know, marked by the flipping coin or whatever, very similar. Each event of a Poisson process was assumed to be here. If you have type A or type B, you probably be a 1 minus B independently on each event. And the number of uh, events of type A was also a Poisson. The total number of events of type A after a unit of time was also a Poisson. And perhaps with a smaller parameter, lambda P instead of lambda. Yeah, very similar. Actually, you could think of the geometric random variable that is the time you're waiting till the first event of type A. Right? Because you might get B, 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 and then an A. Or you might get A right away. So this is actually the waiting time until you get your first A event in a Poisson process. And it turns out that the waiting times between events of a Poisson process are just exponential. That's <coughs> what so it turns out. So what you're saying is the Poisson process has parameter lambda p, that means the waiting time until your first event is exponential with parameter lambda p. It's exactly that situation. Okay. Uh, I took that in words. You probably should take it in pictures. <laughs> okay. If I if I take a Poisson process, which means what a Poisson process is, is that is that really it's just flipping the coins. 
okay? And the event here, okay, occurs. So the event, an event occurred when I get the one, okay, on the continuous loop of the coin. Then they continue to flip and so on. And then after a certain finite amount of time, let's say one unit of time, okay, one T, capital T equals one, all right, in my t clock, all right, then I count how many events I had. That's the Poisson random variable, the number of events, okay, the number of words, and, and um, actually, well, yeah, this number, so this was, uh, Poisson variable was three, right, at that time. So the waiting time between events is exponential. Okay. And what we said was, so then, okay, so the Poisson process, you get an event here, and then you get an event here, and you get an event here. This is, these are X, this wait time is X1, these are Poisson events on the timeline. This is X1 is the waiting time here, X2 is the waiting time here, X3 is the waiting time here. Okay. Now what we're going to do, though, we're going to we're going to call these events independently of type A or B, right? According to a coin flip. This is exactly what we're doing here. Okay. And so actually, we saw the previous problem this way as well. Okay, with this moment generating function technique. And so we're going to say, uh, and then what we get according to that previous problem is a Poisson process of parameter lambda p, right? So you okay. So that was the so waiting time until you get your first A, all right? So that might be here, right? You get B, B, A, okay? All right? So you're actually, that's, but that's, again, because it's a Poisson event process. The A is, the, the sequence of A's forms a Poisson event process. Okay? So you get an X here. Uh, a different x or a y, a y, okay, and then so on, okay? So the timeline with the y's on there, that's also a Poisson process, okay, that was the point. And the waiting time until your first y, uh, a, is the, uh, an exponential variable. The time intervals between the y's is our exponential variables, independent exponential variables. So this is capital S, one, this is capital S, two, so on. I hope that explains it better. So really, yeah, those two problems are intimately related for that picture. Okay, so that's the nice thing about flipping coins. <laughs> okay, you get the new start. Yeah, well, all this independence. It's just as if I had been flipping a coin with the parameter with where I multiplied this, this coin down by the parameter of the coin down by this factor p. I don't get something happen until I get two ones. Okay? Here. Alright. So the parameter of that new coin is P, well the original P1 times P. Okay. So that changes the process have the new parameter. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, I hope that's intuitively satisfying. If it's not rigorously satisfying enough using this moment generating function technique. <clears throat> so a little, a little tangent off into the intuitive. Let's see. Let's do the approximate methods then before we run out of time. So let's do um, the two variable one is the one that's going to be most important. But let's let's go ahead and look at single variable. Um, So approximate mean and variance of a function of random, random variable. Random variable. Okay, so I'm going to have a random variable x, and I'm going to know its mean and variance. dx equals mu and variance of x is sigma squared are known. And suppose I have a known function y 
of this random variable x. What are the mean variance of y? Now, if I don't know the density of x, what if I know the density of capital X, then I can just calculate the mean variance of y by using the uh, formulas at the beginning of chapter 4. However, if I don't know the mean, if I don't know the density of x, what am I going to do? Approximate. Approximate. Okay, so how would I do that? Approximate, right, With, without any other knowledge. Now, any other knowledge other than G that other knowledge I can only approximate the invariance of Y yeah do a Taylor series so how do I do a Taylor series I'm going to expand G Around the mean, okay? G of x is about uh, G of mu plus G prime of mu, x minus mu, right? Plus one half G double prime mu, x minus mu squared. Plus dot, dot, dot. Okay? So now I put little x by capital X. So I replace little x by capital X. So then basically what I have is here, and if I ignore the plus dot, 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 okay, the physicist method. <laughs> I love physicists. I just I have to make a joke every now and then. Okay? So if I then I get a quadratic function of x, right? This is also the probabilist method, as you see here. So couldn't make a joke on ourselves. Okay, g of x is therefore approximately g of mu plus g prime of mu times capital X minus mu plus one half g double prime of mu, that's just a constant, times capital X minus mu squared. So I'm going to approximate y as a quadratic function of x. That's all I'm going to do. I see. Yeah. If we want to estimate the error and how good the approximation is, yeah, you could use Taylor's, which is Lagrange's remainder theorem, I think it's called, where you actually can complete this business where, uh, where uh, you add another term, uh, where you add another term, where you can, you can terminate the series, 1, 6, G triple prime of psi. Uh, x minus mu cubed, or psi, is in the interval from mu to x, okay, or between mu and x, all right, all right. So, if you want to estimate the remainder, this is the remain, so-called remainder in the Taylor expansion, if you want to somehow do something with that, then you use that. Here we're going to ignore all those estimations. We're just going to blindly drop all the other terms and see what we get. Yes? For the top one, is it exact? Because since you have that. Is that exact? Yeah, that's exact. Okay. It equals this. Okay? Let's put the remainder. Okay? Now I'm going to drop the last term and say it's approximately this. Well, what we need to do is look at some examples and see how well it's working. Okay? before you start estimating remainders and stuff like that, okay? And we'll have some rules of thumb later on when we apply this to a real situation and of whether it should work or not, okay? So what we'll do is just try to play with it first. That's all we're going to ask you to do. Play with the formulas. Play with the formulas. You just look at the book and book and apply. This cookbook at this point. It is. Okay. So, <laughs> it's just I want you to do it. Okay. Follow the cookbook. Make the recipe. Okay. 
and then worry about whether, you know, in case you get it or not late. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, what we do, so then EY, if I take the, if I take that quadratic function, I apply the expectation operation, but what do I get? Well, the expectation of x minus mu is zero, right? The expectation of a constant is the constant. So we get g of mu, expectation g of mu, plus expectation g prime of mu times x minus mu. You can see why I expand around the mean now. Plus uh, expectation 1 half g double prime of mu times x minus mu squared. Okay? And this is equal to g of mu, just, just plug in mu into the function, the known function which you're going to transform by. And you assume you know mu. And then you're going to get plus zero. Plus one half, you have to take the second derivative of g and then plug in mu. And then you get times the variance of x. So you get everything in terms of mu, sigma squared, and g. It's going to be g of mu. Why are we assuming half. Um, the second term is zero again? Uh, it just comes out to be zero, not assuming, because ex is equal to mu. Oh. Yes. This is a constant I can pull out, right? Yeah. And then I get e of x minus mu, which is mu minus mu, which is zero. Oh, okay. G prime of mu times mu minus mu equals zero. Ah. Alright? So this is the formula then for the approximate mean. Using only one, using only the linear approximation, you get even a simpler formula for the approximate mean, that is just take g of the mean, right? What would you guess? That was what you would guess, but a little bit better to take this correction term since it comes out nicely. Okay? So when do we get rid of that second term? And you just said it. I just... How do I get it? No. I mean, if I just say I only, if I only wanted it, if I don't include this quadratic term, mm -hmm. then I simply just get g of mu. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's another approximation. This we hope is a little bit better. Okay? <laughs> okay. This is a, and I want you to use this one homework. Okay, don't use the one where you just get this. He mentions you getting just this first. Okay? I want you to use this one. Okay? E Y. Approximately this. Okay. Maybe we should look at that. And then what about the variance of y before we go on? Now the variance, there you really do, because you don't want to get into fourth order terms and so on, because you're going to have to, uh, there we really do truncate it after the linear term. Okay? So for the variance of y, because that's the, it's the way we're going to do it, is the variance is approximately the variance of g prime of mu, excuse me, g of mu plus g prime of mu times x minus mu. So now I'm going to take only the linear approximation of y times the variance. Tell you what's good for. And then, because it's just too complicated otherwise, and you get something, and now this is a constant, and this is a constant. We just did one like that before, right? We had a mu plus a sigma times z. Okay, so this simply comes out to be g prime of mu squared times the variance of x. Okay. Comes out g prime of mu squared times the variance of x minus mu. And the variance of x minus mu is the same as the variance of x, which we get it denoted as sigma squared. Okay? I can get rid of this constant term, right? when I calculate the variance. So that's the secondary uh, formula. Variance of x minus mu is? Variance of x. Again, yeah. just cancel the constant. Oh, the constant. Just cancel the constant. So cancel a bunch of constants, bring out one, put the other constants, and you get g prime mu squared. You only have to take one derivative of g in order to get the variance. <laughs> a, little, a lot easier. Well, yeah, it looks easier. OK, those are the product mean and variance. Mm. Uh, let's see, I did it with a Poisson random variable. I took the square root. Uh, I'm going to run out of time to do all this. 
So maybe I'll quickly do that, just so you can see. I, I better do the example, otherwise it'll kill me. So let's do the example. Now I'm going to tell you to do it two variables. Then I'm going to tell you to do it two variables. And you're essentially going to figure it out when you do your problem number 102. But let's see. Um, so let x be let x be Poisson with parameter lambda. So that means that mu is equal to lambda, and sigma squared is also equal to lambda. Okay? And let y equal the square root of x. So g of x is x to the 1 half. g prime of x is 1 half x to the minus 1 half. And g double prime of x is minus 1 quarter x to the minus 3 halves. Okay, that's all I'm going to need. So I just go ahead and take the derivatives at that point. And then this is plug and chuck. Now I'm putting these two formulas. And for the mean, then therefore e of y is approximately, but g of mu is mu to the one half is so that's lambda to the one half square root of lambda plus one half g double prime, which is a minus one quarter. I'm going to put in mu for x which is lambda, lambda to the minus 3 halves, times um, uh, times the variance, which is also lambda. Okay? So I get that this e y is the square root of lambda minus 1 over 8. U equals lambda again. So lambda is playing the role of mu, is all that's happening here. Okay, so let's see. You know, the only thing that's interesting here is that the variance of y independent of lambda. You'd expect the expectation of y to depend on lambda. What about the variance? The variance of y is then approximately equal to. Uh, so I have to take g prime and put in mu. G prime is 1 half x to the minus 1 half, so that's 1 half lambda to the minus 1 half. Uh, by the way, this is my sigma squared. This is my sigma squared, so I'm putting lambda into my sigma squared. Okay. See what I did? So I put in lambda not only from you, but also for sigma squared. Variance of y is 1 half lambda to the minus 1 half squared, right? Times the variance, which is also a lambda. Okay, that's my sigma squared. Okay, so what does that come out? That comes out about one fourth, independent of lambda. So if I take <laughs> this the well known fact that if the that uh, for Poisson random variable I get a constant variance when I take the square root. Why can you make constant variance? It's not exactly constant. You can actually work out what the variance of y is with the computer and so on. Okay? It's a function of lambda. But it comes out roughly a quarter independent of lambda. Huh. You can't do that by hand, can you? The well, no, because you'd have to take the expectation of the square root. Right? This is the problem. You can take the expectation of the square, that's easy. It's the square root that's the problem. Right? The expectation of y is the problem. Because the expectation of the square of this is just the expectation of x, which is lambda. Okay? Well, notice if I take this expression and I square it, okay, and subtract it from lambda, what do I get? I think I get um, one fourth plus one sixty fourth by lambda, or something like that. Okay, so it doesn't give you the same formula. If I take this and plug it in, all right, this formula is not the same as taking this formula and plugging it into the formula for variance of y. Notice that. Do you follow what I'm saying? If I took if I took e of, of y squared minus the approximate e of y squared, I would get the expectation of y squared is simply lambda minus if I took the approximation of e of y squared, I would get square root of lambda minus one a by one by square root of lambda well, times squared. 
Okay, and this comes out to be, these lambdas cancel. The cross product term comes out to be the one fourth, uh, and then you get uh, minus one sixty four over lambda or something like that. Okay. So it's not quite the same minus to the plus here. So that's not the same as the one fourth, but pretty close. Okay. All right. How do you do that? So how do you do multiple? You do the same exact thing. If I have g of x and y, I know everybody's got to go home. You'll read it in the book. How do I do the Taylor expansion of g of x and y? Okay. The way you do the Taylor expansion of t, g of x and y is you do, this is g, you're going to do two means too, right? A mu1 and a mu2. You have two means and two variances and a correlation. Now, you have five parameters. You have, you have x and y, right? So you're going to talk about the mean of x, you're going to talk about the mean of y, you're going to talk about the variance of x, you're talk about the variance of y, and you're also going to talk about the correlation between x and y. It's five parameters. So that's what you're going to start with, and I want to find the approximate mean and variance of the function of g of x and y. So I do that. Yeah, it's in the book. It's analogous. So why do you do it? Just the only question is the Taylor series. You do a quadratic Taylor series for the mean. You do a linear Taylor series for the variance. It's, otherwise, it's the same. It's the same method, exactly. It's just that this covariance term comes in and so on. So by doing problem 102, you'll work it out. It's a very nice problem, number 102. The correlation is zero in that case, so that makes it quite easy. Oh, good. Makes, so it's it's quite easy. Yeah, because you're assuming x and y are independent in that problem. Ah. Yes. Yes, I have some notes that you can show. Perusals. We're going to go into the theory, law of large numbers, next. Okay. And I did correct the website. Okay. So now, I'll give you next. Maybe a week or I give you a practice test or something? Okay. So you're only going to spend two classes on the test time. Okay. One homework. Because you've had a lot of essential function calculation in your previous course. Where, what? You had a, the main thing is the theory and a little bit of application, but you've had most of the application of the theory in your previous course. Essential limit approximations. Find the, you know, do the essential limit approximation. You've done it before. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Okay. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> The only thing you have to be careful of is if the if you multiply or divide by a negative number you switch the inequality All right, so let's look at some examples of this. Let's start with number 28. On 28, we have 2x plus 5 less than 17. Okay, so we use the same method we used for equalities. We have to get the x by itself. So first we get rid of the 5, we move the 5 over. So then we have 2x less then 17 minus 5 is 12. Then to get that x by itself, we have to divide both sides by 2. So we get x less than 6. So that's one way to express the answer. But they also ask us to put it on a number line. So we're talking about all the numbers smaller than 6. And they also ask us to use interminal, interval notation. So we can say negative infinity up to 6. 
Let's look at another one of those. Let's look at number 38, please. We have on 38, 